So last week I, I spoke I spoke from uh, from Romans chapter twelve and, and verse number two. I was talking about the simple will of God. We we uh, oftentimes I was uh, just simply saying that the the will of God. You know, we talk so much about finding that perfect will of God for our lives, and and uh, and, and, and so oftentimes we miss we miss read verses, we miss use verses, and I've heard it many many times. And you say, well, well, you know, God's got this perfect will of God. We get that from this last part of this verse that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And I've heard it so many times. Er erroneously said that God has this perfect will where He scripted out everything in our lives. I mean, to the very last detail, if you blow that, if you, if you mess up, if you, do, if you make a bad mistake, if you do something you shouldn't do, then you lose that perfect will, and then you have to settle for a good will of God. And, and if you mess that up, then all you got left is an acceptable will of God. And not only is that concept not biblical, but it's horrible. I mean, it's horrible to think that making mistakes or having sin in our lives somehow negates our ability to live in the perfect will of God. So I spoke last week and said the, the will of God is not that mysterious. It's not that hard. It's actually very simple. He lays it out right here. He says if you want to live in the will of God for your life today, just simply ask yourself some questions. Whatever I'm about to do today, whatever I plan to do tomorrow, whatever I plan to do with my life, is it good? Is it is it acceptable? Is it, that means, is it, is it good to the other people around me? The other people can be affected? Is it, is, it, is it perfect? Am I going to follow through with it? You know, young people, they're looking for a, looking for a spouse. And I, I, you know, oftentimes we're, we, tell, we tell young people, churches oftentimes they go to church camp and they hear this, well, you've got to keep yourself pure and you can't make any mistakes. And boy, if you did this or you did that, you've lost the perfect will of God. God's not going to give you the perfect spouse for you. It's nothing like that. God is so capable of bringing people together who are both submitted to Him. So you're on your second marriage or your third marriage. Okay, you can still live in the perfect will of God. Amen. You simply, if you choose to remarry, you, you ask yourself, is he good? Is she good? Do other people in my life, before people think that they're, they're good and so forth. You, you get that. It's, it's really very, very simple. So please don't ever think that you've done anything like that. There, nobody can do anything in this life and not still be able to live in the perfect will of God of God. Don't ever misunderstand that. Now, when I said that, now, now by the way, that doesn't mean live your life any way you want to. Because you still have, again, we ask ourselves, is it good? You know, and, and, and so forth. You get the idea. Now, here's the, here's, the, here's the thing. When I said it was simple, I didn't say it was easy. In fact, you know, Jesus did not come to make life for His followers easy. He came to make life for His followers better. He didn't, he didn't come to make living in this world of ours as a Christian easy. He came so that we would make our lives in this world or live in our, life, our lives in this world in a better way. And make the world a better place. And that's why He came. In fact, He didn't even come to make salvation easy. He came to make salvation possible. Because frankly, it wasn't before He came. <laughs> It really wasn't. I mean, there's no human being could live up to the standard for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So, so he came to make that possible. And, and, uh, but now for us, for those of us who understand the gospel, understand the, the, uh, uh, the, the concept of grace, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, we see salvation as easy, don't we? Because Jesus did everything. There's nothing we do. It's nothing that we, it's no change we make. It's no, no, was it? We believe in Him. And by the way, it's simple also. He did make it simple. Now, because of that though, because salvation is for us easy and simple, because of that, the Christian life should not be. I don't prove that from Scripture. But we need to understand as children, as called, chosen children of God. Children of the living God, followers of Jesus Christ. Please, please get this, and, and let, me, let me share the whole message, and then you make up your mind. If you find it easy to live in this world as a Christian, I would challenge you today to ask yourself, are you really doing it right? Because it's not supposed to be easy. In fact, it's supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be a battle constantly. Let me show you why. So we have this, uh, we go back to verse number 1 in this same passage here. So before he said that about the, you know, the good and the, and the acceptable and all that, 
He writes this. He said, I beseech you therefore, brothers, this is the Apostle Paul. He's telling the church of Rome how, how things would. He said, Jesus did all these things in chapter number 11. So then, he says, so I beseech you. That means I beg you. Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living what? Sacrifice. Is there anything about the word sacrifice that sounds easy? No. I mean, last time I checked, sacrifice is not easy. Sacrifice means you are, you are making yourself or giving something. You're giving up your, your will for yourself in order for something that is much more important than you. Yes? An animal that was sacrificed in the Old Testament on an altar was giving up its life giving up everything in order for something to, for something that is much more important. That's what a sacrifice is. When we make a sacrifice, it means we are choosing to give something up because there is something much more important that we want to make happen. We want to be a part of happening. That's what a sacrifice is. So, it's not supposed to be easy. But notice he said that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And then comes verse number two, and the most important part of this, and what I want to talk about today. And he said, so because of that, be not, would you notice the next word, conformed to this world. Be not conformed to this world. You see, because, because salvation is pretty easy for us. We owe it to our Savior to not conform ourselves to this world. This system. The word world there means this age. We could use the word culture. Society. He said, listen, you're going to have, there's, going to be, there's always going to be two, there are always going to be two goods. There's going to be what God says is good, and there's going to be what some cultures say is good. Are you with me? Hey, you know, you know the uh, you, you you travel halfway around the world. You go to a place like Iraq or some or Iran, and if you're a, and if you're a woman, you'll find a totally different standard of what is good and acceptable. What a horrible thing! And men too, but especially women. Yeah. Cultures decide what is good, and God and, and Paul is making the point. He said, "Look, you, you need to understand. If you're going to live in this world, you're going to be constantly confronted." with two different things that are called good. And by the way, that's not going to change. That's only going to get worse because the Bible says in the end times that men will call good evil and evil good. Right. And he's not talking about us. He's talking about the world. So, so the point is, that I'm trying to make here, is that being conformed to this world, that's easy. Listen, you want, easy? You want an easy life? If you want an easy life, just conform to the world. Amen. Yeah, kids, you want easy A's? Just give the teacher what they want. I look. I, this is no joke. I, I you know, I, it's it's been several decades since I was in college. But you know, several decades ago, I was in college, and I remember for the first time in my life being confronted. I was in a psychology class, being confronted with views that were so opposite everything that I had believed and kind of grew up believing. And I had to make a choice. And boy, the first time I put something on a test that was contrary to what that. Uh, that professor wanted to hear. I, you know, it was, and I was right. <coughs> I was right biblically. But boy, I got one of the worst grades I ever got in my life. You know what I did? I conformed. I conformed because I wanted a good transcript. I wanted to get good grades. I wanted to do, I was, you know, and, you know and, and and I look back on that and I realize. You know, this is what this is what we're talking about. You know, conforming is easy. It's easy. If, if, if you want an easy life, conform. Kids, if you want an easy life, just conform to what your easy time of school. Just conform to what your to what your teachers want. You know, if you husbands, if you want an easy life, just conform to what your wife wants. <laughs> women, if you want an easy life, convince your husband to conform to what you want. <laughs> There are ways you can do that, by the way. <laughs> Most of the time. Look, you want an easy life? You want an easy life, child of God? Conform your language to the language the world's using right now. <clears throat> you know, go ahead. Just you know, say, okay, well, I'm going to use the terms that the world uses, and I'm not going to use them. You know, you want an easy life about the values that the, that the culture has. You want an easy life? You know, we want things easy. We, we do all those things. We conform ourselves. We follow their rules and so on. Now, please understand, that's not to say that, that everything's bad. It's not to say that everything's wrong in the world. Not everything in the world's wrong. All right, for example, 
We, uh, hop, boy, I gotta tell you, and this is probably a sin, so I probably should confess it. Um, I, it's kind of what I'm doing now, but if it's a sin, you know, I'm sorry. I am taking such delight in the turmoil that the Holly weirdos are having. <laughs> I am so, I am so enjoying all of that. You know, it, you know, I don't read details about it, but I just love the fact that they don't know what to do. They don't know what to do with each other, and they're having all kinds of problems. And you know, and some of them are getting canceled now. I'm enjoying that, but you know, this this thing of Hollywood, you know, this the the Me Too movement that came out not too long ago. That was good. That was right. You know, the Harvey Weinstein's of our world Amen. needed to come into the crosshairs for how they were treating young women. Yes, Amen. and every church should get behind that. Right. That treatment of women. But here's the problem. That's the easy part. They haven't changed a thing about what they put on, on the big screen. Amen. How hypocritical is it to call out the, the producers and the directors for their treatment of that and for the vulgarities and for the, for the lack of morality and say, well, this is not right, this is not right. And yet you still put the same, the same uh, um, right. vomit yeah. Yeah. on the big screen. Not changing anything there. See, they're ignoring the bigger problem, yeah. ignoring the bigger issue, and and so so society wants them to be held accountable in that, but they'll still show graphically anything else. You know, they, here, here's here, here's here's basically the same the same societal standards that are now condemning people like that made people like that. Yeah. Right. You get that right? Right. That's like starting a forest fire and then getting mad because it spreads. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, it doesn't work like that. You've got to start something. You've got, to, got to put something into place and then get mad when it gets carried away. Well, what do you think people do? Do you ever rile a two-year-old up? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and then you get mad at them for getting out of control? See, the, the problem is we, we society... Society and cultures oftentimes they like to pick and choose what which rotten apples they want to pull out of the barrel. Yeah. Harvey Weinstein a rotten apple? Of course he is. But he's far from the only one. Yeah. Ignoring a whole bunch of them. You know, in every movie studio is filled with them. You know, these, 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 these actors and actresses, they're just as vulgar, just as baseless. These these and again, I know this is sexist, I know it's chauvinistic, but you know, sorry. But it's worse coming from a woman. I agree. And just thank you. <laughs> and the mouths on these women. It's its its just horrible. It's gross. Well, I know some of you are saying, well, that's, that's not right. You can't single out women. I just did. <laughs> it's bad for everybody. But my point is, though, so, they, so, so, so God is saying, I don't want you to conform to that. I don't want you adopting what Hollywood says is okay. You know, we shouldn't be mimicking what we see in, in groups like that in our homes Amen. or in our church you know, or anywhere we go, even if there's not any other Christians around. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Good, I count on you. Bill Ackley's not here. I still got a bill in my pocket. <laughs> concerned so much about changing society, and I'm not either. That's a hopeless cause. What Paul was concerned about is whether or not the church was going to conform to that. Amen. He said, what you cannot do, what I need, what, what Jesus needs you to not do is conform yourself, your behaviors, your language, your manner of carrying yourself. He said, don't conform yourself to their standards. You keep yourself conformed to the standard that God has. Amen. And that's really the point we're, we're talking about today. So, so again, you know, it, it, so, it, it, so it's, it's not hard. We go back to asking ourselves those questions, same questions. Is it good? But let, me, let, me, let, me, let me poke into your life here for just a minute. Is what you watched on TV last night good? Hey, don't brag. It's a rhetorical question. Is what 
is, it, was it good? Say, well, define good. I don't have to define good. You know what good is. I'm so sick of hearing, you know, every child of God knows what good is. Amen. Amen. Every child of God knows what not good is. Amen. Amen. You gotta whisper it, it's probably not good. <laughs> if you'll say it on your if you'll if you'll post it, but you won't say it to somebody's face, it's not good. In fact, that's powerful. Stop posting stuff that you wouldn't confront somebody with personally. In fact, by the way, the Bible way when you've got an issue with somebody is go to that person personally. In a good spirit, in a Christian spirit, and lovingly, kindly, discuss it. See if you can't work it out. If you can't work it out, well, then you can bring somebody else in. And yell at them. Okay? <laughs> but not until then. Not until then. So anyway, the point is, we, we, want to be, we want to be careful of that. So again, I said Jesus came. Jesus didn't come to make the world easy. He came to the Christian life easy. He came to make it better. Let me show you. He actually made things simpler, but he made them much more difficult. Let me, let me just give you, some, let me give you some examples here. Take a look at Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 17. So Jesus was doing some teaching. And, uh, and in fact, this is, this is part of his most famous sermon. He said, I don't want you to misunderstand. He said, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. He said, I'm not coming to, to do away with everything, what we would call the Old Testament, the Jews would call the Torah. He said, I don't think I'm coming to just destroy that. I'm not coming to throw it away. I'm not coming to get rid of it. But what I am coming to do, he said, I'm not coming to destroy, but I'm coming to fulfill. Now, what does that mean? He said, I'm coming to make it full. I'm coming to, to complete it. I'm coming to, in fact, he said, you know, the sacrifices, for example... He said, I will complete those in my own body. Right. Yep. I will fulfill that. But all those laws, all those ideas, all those, those things that you're, the, the thou shalt nots and the thou shalts, those, those, those commandments that we read about, not just the first ten, but all 613, he said, let me help you with this. Let me simplify this for you. And I'm sure at the time, the, the people who were listening to him thought, well, that's good because it's really complicated. He said, let me simplify it for you. They probably thought it was going to get easier. But watch what he said. Verse number 22. Notice he said, For I say unto you that except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now time out. When they heard this, that does not jive very well with him saying, I'm going to simplify things. Because what we call, okay, we call people Pharisees today sort of a, in a churchy way. That, that means hypocrite to us. That is not what the case was then. They actually were the paramount. They were the epitome of righteousness. They obeyed the law. They did everything right. They were considered to be the, the most righteous of all people, and they truly were. They obeyed the law yeah. to every detail, as much as they could. They were, the, they were the best there was. And Jesus said, if you really want to be righteous, you've got to be better than them. You've got to be better than they are. And so that probably didn't, they didn't understand. So here's what Jesus said. Let me show you some examples. He said, let me give you some examples. How about verse 27? Notice, he said this then, verse number 27. He said, you've heard that it was said of them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. Have we all heard that? Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Do we all agree that's not good? Right. Okay. <laughs> See, we know what's good. We know what's not good. He said, thou shalt not commit adultery. And everybody said, oh, that's, that's great, you know. But then there are, but I'll tell you something, if he had stopped right there, it'd be one thing. But there are millions and millions of Jesus followers right now probably wishing he had stopped right there. And let me show you why. He simplified it, but he made it much harder. But I say to you that whosoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already. It is hard. See, that's much simpler. It's simple. I mean, he basically said, look, you better be careful what you look at. Because if you're careful what you look at, if you don't look at the wrong thing, you're not going to chase after the wrong thing. Yep. Right. Right. See, he went to the root of the problem. Much harder, though. And boy, don't you know this is this now? So which one? So which one's simpler? Well, that one's much simpler. Which one's harder to do? There are there are millions and millions of people who say, "Well, I would never cheat on my wife. I would never cheat on my husband." Really? Read it again. Read it again. See, he made it simpler. We made it much harder. The Christian life is not supposed to be easy. Amen. Hey, it is supposed. It is supposed to be. Don't please don't miss this. It is supposed to be a struggle for you to be to to not look at things you shouldn't look at. Right. It's supposed to be hard. 
It's supposed to be, you say, well, I just don't have any trouble at all with that. I don't struggle at all with that. And here's the question you better ask yourself. Are you sure? Or have you simply conformed and accepted the world's view of what's okay and what's not okay? Because Jesus' standard is awfully high. Jesus' standard is awfully high. And that should be something that everybody has to struggle with. Okay, look, I don't know what the two of you are laughing about. <laughs> you better behave. You're giving yourself away. <laughs> Let me give you another example. Look at, look, look at, uh, look at uh, verse, uh, verse 43. Verse 43. He said, You heard it's been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. He said, But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. And the good of them that hate you. And pray for them. You, know, you see how Jesus raised the bar? But see, you're not going to kill somebody that you love. You're not, going to, you're not going to hurt somebody that you love. I didn't read the one about, about uh, you know, he said, he said, look, you know, you, you heard it been said, don't kill anybody. Well, everybody knows that, right? Yeah. He said, but you're not even supposed to be angry with your brother without a cause. You're not supposed to be angry with your brother without a cause. You're not supposed to be angry with your brother. Amen. Amen. Yeah, but it sounds better just to say that one. <laughs> you know what he's saying without a good reason. Okay, and so... We conform ourselves to the world when we say, well, I have a good reason. Wait, do you? Do you? Does God think you do? By whose standard do you have a good reason? This is what Jesus is trying to... He, the, the, the point here is, he's trying to get to a foundational issue here because I think oftentimes, we, we as Christians, we've got to be so very, very wary. If we find ourselves at ease in this world, if we find ourselves no longer struggling to battle the temptations of this world, that's where you know in all likelihood it's not because you have become Mother Teresa. It's more likely that we've simply conformed to the world's standards of what is good and what is acceptable. That's the far more likely conclusion. So, let me, let me just, let me just, look, again, man, please understand, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to, 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 to raise a militia here, to fight the government, or anything like that. I'm not interested in all oh, of that. Oh, darn. <laughs> Never going to be that. So listen, but I am talking about our personal lives, and our personal views. You know, parents, can I, can I just give you a word of advice as your pastor? Don't allow these public schools to make you conform what you believe is right for your child to what they think is right for your child. Don't you do that. Don't you do that. You stick to your guns. If you believe something is right for your child, you have the right to do it. And by the way, this, this fight that's going on in Florida right now by Disney, I will never go to Disney World again as long as I live. I won't buy their movies. I won't spend money for that. I will not do it. Because, the, because parents have a right to parent their children, and nobody else has a right to parent your children. Amen. I, have no, I have nothing on your children. You, you, are, you are solely responsible for what happens to your children. And don't you ever let anybody take that right away. Because you do what God thinks you should do. You do what God has given you the liberty to do. But please understand, when you choose to do that, it's going to be hard. Isn't it, Hannah? Yes, sir. Hannah had to take a stand on a very important issue. Now, I don't think you ought to, look, I don't think you ought to fight in schools over minor things, but, but if you've got a child, you're the one responsible for them. They don't care about your child. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. I mean, they, they care some. Don't, don't be wrong. And there's good teachers out there that are struggling to try to teach in this world. They're so laid down with rules and, and policies they have to do and all this junk that they have to do, but the school boards are placing it upon them. And, but the biggest issue is, is parents should always have that right. So parents take that, take that responsibility very seriously. Don't conform to the world. If you're okay with it, that's fine. But don't you let yourself be pressured into conforming what the world tells you that you need to do. And that's not to say that everything in a public school is bad either. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm just saying we need to be careful about that. You know, they, the... Uh, we need to be. I've got to watch the time here. I think you get you get the main you get the point of what I'm trying to make here. We need to ask ourselves in our conversation the way we deal with people: Is it good? Is it acceptable? 
You know, is it within the will of God what I plan to do and who I plan to be with and what I plan to say and how I'm going to say it? You know, we, we you say, well, you know, I, look, the world's, the world's use of words, I can't change the way the world uses words. But I want to be mindful of the way I do. You should be mindful of the way you do. Amen. We should, as children of God, we should be mindful of how we use vocabulary. And is it good? Is it acceptable? Is it perfect? Well, there's nothing wrong with this. By whose standard? By whose standard? By the world standard? Or by God's standard? You know, because because you know what God says? You know what God's view of using words is? He said one time, uh, one time the, the scripture tells us, let your words be few. Well, how about that one right there? Amen. Let your words be few. He also says, let it be seasoned with salt. That means make it pleasant, palatable for the people that are going to hear. Yeah. You know, he, he, he says, uh, you know, you, let, let your speech be that which edifies. In fact, let me give, let me give you a look at Proverbs, uh, what did I give you? Proverbs 29 11. Look at this one. A fool utters all his mind, but a wise man keeps it until afterward. Wow. You can not care for that one. <laughs> well, I just speak my mind. Okay. First of all, if you can utter all your mind, you ain't very smart. <laughs> it should take a little longer than a conversation to utter everything you know. But the point he's trying to make here is say, look, we need to be careful about how we use our words. As a child of God, let me say this, a couple more things. As a child of God and as an American citizen, you have the right to affiliate yourself with, with whatever political philosophies you want to, it doesn't make any difference. You call yourself what you want to call yourself, align yourself with whoever you want to align yourself with. But child of God, it is time for the, for the true followers of Jesus Christ to take a step back from our emotions or how we were brought up or what we've always held to and ask myself, are the people that I affiliate myself in line with that book? Amen. That's right. Because if they're not, then we've conformed ourselves to the world. God has some things to say about the value of life. Yes. Amen. God has some things to say about marriage. God has some things to say about, about uh, what is right in this world and how we should treat each other and all those things. And we need to be very, very careful. God has some things to say about freedom and, and protecting freedom and, and, and all those things. And we need to be very, very careful about that. But right now, it is hard to take a stand against that, isn't it? I talked to the parents here a few minutes ago about school. It's hard. You know, I... Look, we went through this as a church. Do you know two years ago, almost to this day, the illustrious governor of the state of Ohio, for the first time in my, uh, that I've ever heard him actually mention God by name, but he said, he said, pastors like me are irresponsible. Why? Because we kept the doors of this church open all through that. Yeah. Now listen, you may say, well, you should, you think I should have done that? That's fine. That was my decision to make. I asked our deacons to approve my decision. We kept these doors open because I, uh, I, I just felt like that was right. People were looking for hope. And boy, we saw some amazing things during that time. We took the precautions we could try to take in those early days. You know what? And, 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 and again, you know, and I said earlier, God always has the final word. I'm so thankful right now that Johns Hopkins University and Princeton and all these other laboratories, all that, everything I said at the time, they're now saying, yeah, that was exactly right. But I was an irresponsible person. And by the way, I took a lot of heat. You all don't even know. I took a lot of heat. I had hate calls from other churches. I mean, hate calls. Like, what do you think you're doing? You, you, don't, you can't do that. You're irresponsible. You know all these things. It's like, you know what? I didn't, I didn't ask you before we started this church, and I'm not asking your opinion now. You do you, and I'll do me, and we'll do us, and we stayed open that entire time, and people were saved, and lives were changed, people found hope, people found a reason to keep going, and they and, and, and you know, and I would do it again in a second. But it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy, was it? It's not supposed to be easy. Now, by the way, we're not ever going to be a built church. Don't, don't, please don't think that's we're not. We don't pick up, we don't look for a fight. But I don't want to conform to the world either. Amen. I don't want to conform to anything other than the Word of God, best we can. So here's, here's all I'm done. I'm, done. I'm asking today, is your Christian life easy? Is it easy? I don't answer. Well, you can't. It's a rhetorical question. 
You say, well, what do you mean, is it easy? I mean, is it easy for you to resist sin? Is it easy for you to resist giving in when you changing your beliefs to conform more to if, if you find it easy to not take a stand for, for Jesus, then the problem is not that you're that right and wrong have changed. The problem is we have allowed ourselves to conform to this world. We've left the things that God said is good and acceptable and perfect, and we've come over here and for the sake of ease. So that nobody's after us, nobody's you know hounding us, nobody criticizing us, nobody's talking about us behind our back, and and maybe you, maybe our pockets are being uh, our wallets are being affected by it. We have decided that it's just simply easier to give in, to go along, to just be and do and say what the world is telling us to do and say. And all I'm asking is this then. Find yourself, look, if you find yourself having to fight to resist temptation, good. 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 Because it means that you haven't changed what you believe is right. You with me? Amen. If you're having to fight the temptations of this world, to fight giving in to things, that's good because it means you have not conformed to the world's view of what is right and what is wrong. So when the day comes that you stop feeling like it's hard, better check and see, do I still stand where I used to stand on these really important issues? And, and I think you get, you get the point here. So here's my, here's my, here's my point. Just I'm simply asking, are you confirming your faith or conforming your faith? If we, if we conform ourselves to the world's view of what's right and wrong, then we have conformed, just like Paul warns about. But if it continues to be hard, if we continue to stand, if we continue to try to swim upstream, if we continue to try to work counter, counter uh, to this culture's movement, then we know that we're confirming our faith. And God is watching. And He always gets the last word. And he's going to get the last word here, I think, fairly soon. Amen. Amen. In this world. Until then, let's just not let's not conform ourselves to this world.